Part 1 There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only and you will hear a conversation between two people talking about insecticide. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. Yes? Oh, good morning, madam. I'm from Pestaway Market Research. I'm doing consumer research in this area. I wonder if you'd mind telling me, do you use Pestaway in your home? Pestaway? Oh, the insecticide thing. Well, yes, as a matter of fact, I do. Well, what do you use it for, madam? Fleas, ants, cockroaches, woodworm? Oh, cockroaches. This is an old house, you see, and we often get cockroaches in the kitchen. I tried scrubbing and disinfecting, but it didn't seem to do much good. And then I heard a commercial about Pest Away, so I thought I'd try that. Was that on TV? No, it was radio, one of those early morning shows. You heard it advertised on the radio? Fine. And you say you use it in the kitchen. Do you use it anywhere else in the house? In the bathroom, say? Oh, no. We've never had any trouble anywhere else. We get the odd wasp in the summer sometimes, but I don't bother about them. It's the cockroaches I don't like. Nasty, creepy, crawly things. And you find Pest Away does the trick? Well, yes. It's quite good. It gets rid of most of them. How long have you been using it, madam? Oh, let's see. About two years now, I think. About two years. And how often do you find you have to spray? Oh, I give the kitchen a good spray round the skirtings and under the stove, you know, about every six weeks. Every six weeks or so, I see. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions six to ten. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. About every six weeks. Every six weeks or so, I see. Uh, where do you buy your pest away, madam? A supermarket? Chemist? Oh, no. I get it at the little shop at the end of this street. They stock practically everything. It means taking a bus if I want to go to the supermarket. Well, thank you very much, madam. Oh, could I have your name, please? Mrs. Edgerton. Mary Edgerton. That's E-G-E-R-T-O-N. E-G-E-R-T-O-N. And the address? The address is 12 Holly, Peterford. 12 Peterford. And may I ask your age, madam? Oh, well, just put down I'm over 50. As you like, Mrs. Egerton. And occupation? Housewife? Well, I used to be a telephonist before I married. I had a very good job at the post office, but what with a husband to look after and four children to bring up, it doesn't leave you much time, does it? Occupation, housewife. Well, thank you very much for your time, madam. You've been most helpful. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear an introductory speech to students at a summer school. You have thirty seconds to look at questions eleven to fourteen. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Climb Summer School. Now, I know most of you have travelled a long way to get here, and you're probably looking forward to settling into your rooms. So I promise I won't keep you long. But we've got to get through this very brief induction just to make your stay here as pleasurable as possible. Now, as you can see, while we're located very close to the centre of London, we're actually quite cut off from the main road. And we've got plenty of space for our facilities and students. This was part of our founder's vision, Jasmine Klein, who thought that the best environment for teenage students would be a place that combines the comforts of a big cosmopolitan city with the beauty and serenity of a quiet, remote site. Now, back in 1983, when our school was founded, this all here was an abandoned warehouse. And the classes were held in the main building that you can see over there. There were no trees, no conifers surrounding the property. There wasn't even a main gate. It took years and a great deal of effort to get our school to where it is today. And I'm sure that if you take a look at page thirty-four in your brochures, where you can find a picture of what the school used to look like back then, you'll agree that the changes we've made are more than impressive. But it's not just the facilities that make Climb Summer School special, obviously, and I'm certain you already know this. Over the following ten weeks, you'll receive an assortment of classes on a variety of topics, ranging from language, literature, and poetry to creative writing, communication, and project management. All of these modules have been designed to improve your chances of getting a place in the universities of your choice. While also giving you the opportunity to learn, excel, and of course also socialise with people from all over the world, I can tell you, just among the thirty of you, we've got about twenty-one different nationalities. So what happens now? First of all, I'll be handing out a map of the premises for you to have a look at and explaining where everything is. Once we're done here. You'll all be taken to your rooms where you can unpack and relax for a couple of hours, and later on we'll be having our first activity of the day—a mix and match lunch in the main hall, where you'll have the chance to meet your new classmates. Later on in the afternoon, we'll be handing out your first project assignments and splitting you into teams. And tonight we'll be having our very first film night, starting with an early twentieth-century special. You now have thirty seconds to look at questions fifteen to twenty. So, let's get on with the map. You've already got a version of it in your brochures, so if you can open them to the last page, so we can have a look. Very well. As I showed you before, the actual school is right over there in the middle. That's where you'll be having most of your classes. Adjacent to it, you'll find the main hall, which is where we'll be hosting most events, such as today's lunch. On the left from the main building, you'll find a smaller building. Which is where the accommodation and welfare offices are located. This is labelled as the garden office at the front, and it's easy to spot because it has a green door. Each of you is assigned to a different residence hall. We've got three residence halls in total: one on the left and two on the right. 
The one right next to the garden office is Ursula Hall, named after our founder's sister, while the other two are Peter Hall and William Hall. Now, as you can see, there are three more buildings to the left of the semicircle here, and one more building on the right-hand side, next to William Hall. So that one, which is shaped a bit like a dome, is the pavilion. This is where all your letters will be delivered, and in the basement floor you'll also find a laundrette. Please make sure you've got plenty of one-pound coins, as you'll need one for the washing machine and another for the dryer. And that row of buildings on the left, the one closest to us here at the gate, is the canteen, where you'll be able to buy snacks as well as breakfast, lunch and dinner, on days when we don't have an event with food provided. The next one is the gym, which is open from 7am to 8pm from Monday to Friday, and until 10pm at the weekend. And the last building, right over there, is the study centre, where you'll find plenty of computers and books, as well as a great selection of DVDs and magazines that you can borrow with only a small refundable deposit of £5. Now, please remember to keep your student card with you at all times, as you'll need it to access most of these facilities. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a group of students. Henry, Joe, Nancy, and Gordon. Discussing changes to their work experience placement arrangements. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 26. Look, there's the notice that Professor Jones told us he'd be putting up confirming the details of our work experience placements. But I thought that was already arranged. No, he said he'd have to check with the companies that the days we preferred were okay for them. Let's see if any have changed. Therese is not here today, but her name's first. It says the Uni Bookshop, Friday mornings starting on the 23rd of March. So nothing's changed. I'll let her know. What about Manuel? He's not here either. Is he still going to the music store in the High Street? If it's mainly music, Yes, he's still down for that on Friday afternoons, starting on the 9th. Um, the day's different. It's changed from Tuesday mornings, but that's OK. I'll tell him. He'll really enjoy listening to music all day. Now, where's my name? Henry. Here it is. I'm going to the beauty shop, and I said I preferred Thursday afternoons. Oh, good, that seems okay. And my start date hasn't changed either. Joe, what day did you opt for? I'm going to Highway Hotels on Monday mornings. Yes, that's okay. And starting on Monday the 12th of March. Oh, has that been changed? Okay, I was scheduled to start the week before. I'll just make a note of that. What about me, Henry? Have I still got the Explore Travel Service on Wednesday mornings? Just a minute. 
Where's your name? Mm, let's see. Nancy. Okay, here it is. Explore travel on Wednesdays. Yes, but afternoons and starting date is Wednesday the 14th of March. Has the date changed? No, not the date, just the time, which is fine. I'll get to sleep in. You lazy thing, Nancy. Chris's name is next on the list. Gorgeous Gowns Fashions. What a name. Yes, it sounds good, doesn't it? I'm hoping he'll bring me some free samples. So, has he still got Wednesday mornings? Yes, Wednesday mornings starting on the 14th of March. OK, I'll tell him when I see him tonight that his arrangements haven't changed. Gordon, what about you? I chose that software company that makes computer games. I can't remember its name, but I asked for Tuesday afternoons. Oh, oh yes. Here it is. Games to go on Wednesday mornings. There's a note here saying they have their weekly staff meetings on Tuesday afternoons, so that wouldn't be much use to you. That's why they've changed it to Wednesdays. Starting on the 21st of March, so you can see their working set up. OK, I'm glad they've changed it. I don't think I'd want to sit through a meeting every week. Before the conversation continues, you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now, as the conversation continues, answer questions 27 to 30. Can someone remind me what time we have to get to our placement in the afternoons? It says here, mornings start at 9am and afternoon sessions at 1pm. Oh, that's a shame. I thought Professor Jones was going to change it to 9.30am and 1.30pm. Yes, he did say that he'd try to make it later, but obviously that wasn't possible. By the way, just in case, what happens if we're ill or something and can't make it? Do we phone the college or the place we're going to? I think we have to phone the company first and then the college. Didn't you get the information sheet about work experience at our last seminar? No, I missed it because I had to go to the dentist. What else did it say? Well, we have to do a total of 24 hours altogether, so if we miss one of the arranged sessions, we have to organise another time to make up the hours. And he gave us details of the presentation we have to give about our work experience. Oh really? What do we have to do? In week 10, we each have to give a presentation to the class about the company we've been with. It's 30% of a final mark for this subject. So it's going to be a lot of work. Yes, he's expecting us to do a lot of research while we're there so that we can outline the history of the company, its management structure, number of employees, other branches, etc. And he said we should use lots of visuals such as diagrams and flowcharts during the presentation. Yes, and we should also include what we did each week the different departments of the company or positions that we observed and try to relate what we saw to our studies so far. He gave examples like management style, accounting systems, information technology and so on. You were right. It sounds like lots of work. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a lecture about English language. You have thirty seconds to look at questions thirty-one to thirty-seven. Those of you who were here last week will remember that we talked about the journey of the English language from its early Indo-European origins through to Old English, Middle English, and then to Early and Late Modern English before it reached the form that it has today. Today, we will be continuing that theme by focusing on the future of the English language and all the places it might go from here. There are about 2.1 billion people around the world who can speak English. Out of these. Only 400 million are native speakers, which means that four in five English speakers are non-natives. This is obviously quite an impressive number, considering that just two centuries ago, in 1801, there were only about 20 million speakers of English around the world, and languages like French and German were ahead of English in terms of how many people were using them. But what does it mean? What it means is that the future of the English language doesn't really depend on its native speakers, but on that massive number of non-native speakers learning it around the world. Has everyone has anyone heard the term pidgin before or creole? A pidgin is a simplified version of a language which acts as a bridge between two people who don't have a common language, allowing them to communicate with each other. While a creole is a language that evolves from a pidgin, with the difference that it is fully formed with clear grammatical rules and vocabulary, there are currently dozens of pidgin and creole languages based on English around the world. For example, Nigerian pidgin or Jamaican patois. These languages are also known as Englishes. What's interesting about these Englishes is how different they sound to, for lack of a better term, proper English. Take the word trousers, for instance. In Sheng, which is a Kenyan Creole language, they're called longi because they're long. But even versions of English that are recognized as official variations or dialects still differ greatly from each other. Americans and Jamaicans would call the back of a car where you store your luggage the trunk. Britons, Australians, Canadians, and other Commonwealth countries would call it the boot. A subway in the UK is a tunnel under a road that allows pedestrians to cross safely. In the US, it's an underground train. You might think of these differences as minute, but when you take into account the dozens of different versions of English out there, a very intriguing parallel arises with another language from the past, Latin. Latin too used to be a lingua franca. Nowadays, it's all but dead, spoken only by a few clerics and scholars. At some point in history. It splintered into various different languages, which became known as Romance languages, for example, Spanish, Italian, or French. There are some that theorize that the same thing might happen to English in the near or distant future, that all these Englishes we have today in different countries will continue to develop, so pidgins will turn into Creole languages, and Creole languages will turn into just languages, and English itself, as we know it today, will disappear. Or become less and less important. It's an interesting theory, if nothing else. You now have thirty seconds to look at questions thirty-eight to forty. It makes sense that as English grows in popularity, countries, especially those with a strong sense of identity and tradition, will develop their own versions of the language, marked by the idiosyncrasies of their culture. 
Just think of the contribution of dialects such as Jamaican or South African English. In the past 50 years alone, they've added about 25,000 words to the English language. Most of these related to a local context that wouldn't have existed in English before the spread of colonialism. In terms of numbers, just those are enough for a brand new language. There are some flaws to this theory too, however. While it's true that Latin and English have a lot of similarities in terms of how they developed or have developed throughout history, there is one big difference. We currently live in an era of globalization. Today, you can be in India and stream an American film or TV series in seconds. You can be in Nigeria and listen to British music. You can be in Brazil and read a novel from an Australian author. Just a few centuries ago, this was unthinkable. So what's the other way that English could go? According to some experts, there's the possibility that it could maintain its status as the world's global language, but with a few differences. Already today, most conversations in English occur between non-native speakers. While many of these might be fluent, the majority probably only have an intermediate understanding of the language, devoid of the nuances, colloquialisms, and complex collocations that native speakers employ in their interactions. This means that over time, English could turn into some sort of world speak, the official lingua franca for the entire world, but in a simplified form. Some scholars have even started trying to develop that version of English by selecting the most useful words in the English vocabulary for non-native speakers to learn. Robert McCrum has compiled a comprehensive list of 1,500 words, for example, a version of English that he calls globish. And what about traditional native speaker English? It might continue to exist, but lose its popularity, as the previous theory suggests. There are many more theories about the future of the English language, of course. I've only focused on the two main ones, because they clearly demonstrate our uncertainty when it comes to how this beautiful language will develop. English is in a unique, unprecedented position. No other language has achieved the same levels of popularity in human history, especially in terms of non-native speakers. So, as this is clearly uncharted territory, only time will be able to tell us what will happen.